Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining today uh, for the Grasp on Robotics uh, talk series. Uh, I'm Pratik Chaudhary from Electrical and Systems Engineering here at FEM, and I'll be the faculty host for today's talk. Uh, a couple of uh, quick reminders. So previously recorded talks can be found on the YouTube channel for the Grasp Laboratory. Uh, and uh, for the attendees of this talk, uh, during the talk, please feel free to um, uh, submit questions uh, using the question and answer setting in Zoom webinars. Uh, there will also be a short session on answering questions uh, at the end of the talk. So uh, uh, if you have more elaborate questions, uh, please uh, um, ask them at that time. Um, uh, let me introduce uh, Dorsa Sadig. We are very glad to have her as a speaker today. Uh, Dorsa is an assistant professor in uh, computer science and electrical engineering at Stanford University. Uh, her research interests lie at the intersection of robotics, uh, learning, and control theory. And uh, she has been interested in working on uh, safe uh, and adaptive systems uh, and algorithms for human robot interaction. Uh, and personally, for me, I think her work uh, uh, straddles a very interesting boundary between modeling uh, humans in settings where they do interact with uh, autonomous agents. And uh, when you cannot always model such uh, behaviors uh, elaborately, you can learn away these behaviors. So use machine learning to fill in the gap between what you model and uh, what uh, actual behaviors consist of. Um, Dorsa received her PhD uh, in electrical engineering computer science from UC Berkeley in 2017. And uh, she also did her undergraduate at uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, in a short career, she has won a number of uh, uh, prominent awards. So the NSF Career, uh, AFSR Young Investigator Award, the MIT Innovators Under 35 Award, and a number of them from the industry as well. Uh, today, she will talk about learning and influencing conventions in interactive robotics. Uh, looking forward to it. The floor is all yours, Dorsa. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks for the for, for the for the very nice introduction. So let me uh, get started. So I'm gonna basically I'm not gonna monitor chat, but if there are questions, feel free to ask them in the middle, and and there's going to be someone who can basically like uh, ask those questions in the middle of the talk too. So if anything is unclear, just feel free to ask those questions. Uh, and I don't need to go over everything. So I have a number of slides, but uh, we can make this more of a discussion too. Uh, so yeah, so I'm Dorsa, and, and in general, in my research is in the space of understanding interactions and planning better for interactions. And, and today, what I want to talk about is I want to talk about two core categories of work that we are doing in the lab. One on trying to, to better learn from non-traditional sources of data, from interaction data, better learn models of humans. And then the other category of work is to actually build better interactive systems, learning and interactive systems that can coordinate and collaborate better. So why do we care about interaction? Maybe let's first start kind of ad addressing that question. So if you think about robotic systems or AI systems, we have we've finally got to a point where we can think about long-term and, and repeated interactions with these autonomous agents, right? Like we are seeing autonomous cars on our roads. Waymo is releasing these cars in San Francisco. We are starting to see like these types of assistive robots uh, in homes helping in, in healthcare settings or in homes. Uh, helping people to feed themselves or put clothes on. And in general, like service robotics is, is kind of like a direction that, that we, we, we see in, in, in the field of robotics and autonomy. And that kind of brings us this question of interaction with, with humans and, and this question of how do we model the human robots interaction side of things. So one very common way of modeling this type of interaction is, is to use this idea of theory of mind or this game theoretic type of modeling where you assume that two humans come together and they try to, let's say, solve a task. Let's say they're trying to solve a collaborative or competitive task. Maybe, maybe they're trying to play a game of chess. And one way of modeling this coordination between these two agents is to consider the fact that each one of these agents is, is going to have some model of the other agent, some model of the opponent or some model of the partner. And, and the fact that that partner is also thinking about them. And, and there is kind of like this game theoretic, like recursive belief modeling paradigm that shows up here. 
And then this has many names and shows up in, in a variety of fields everywhere that, that there is a notion of interaction. This idea of theory of mind modeling shows up, right? Like in game theory, this is basically solving for the equilibrium of the game. Uh, in multi-agent reinforcement learning, people refer to this as opponent modeling. Uh, in natural language processing, this shows up as pragmatics or the rational speech act. So, so in all of these fields, we kind of know that we have to have some model, some representation of this opponent. And the thing is that requires this recursive belief modeling, which tends to be computationally pretty challenging, right? Like you need to have a model of the other agent and the fact that the other agent is thinking about you and so on. And that tends to be computationally pretty unscalable. So all of these fields realize that, well, we need to make some sort of approximation. A very common approximation is to instead of worrying about the full game, maybe we can cut the game at some time step, at the nth time step. And instead of me solving for the equilibrium of the game, maybe I can solve like an nth order theory of mind problem. Maybe I can solve a stack over a game where, where we are looking at only like two steps of the game. And that's the type of approximation that is common that commonly shows up in human robot interaction. So if you look at a lot of prior work in the space of human robot interaction, basically that game is being cut. The human needs to have some model of the robot. The robot needs to have some model of the human. And then we go about modeling the interaction using these game theory type of techniques. This is actually something that I used to work on quite a bit, like back, there, back at Berkeley during my PhD. We did quite a bit of work in the space of autonomous driving, where we were looking at how an autonomous car should interact with a human-driven car. So, so just briefly, the way we looked at this problem was we thought that, well, we were going to have an autonomous car, let's say that's the orange car, and we were going to have a human-driven car, that's the white car. And if you want to think about their interaction, maybe the autonomous car trying to change lanes and, and go to the left lane, one way of modeling that interaction is using this game theoretic type of paradigm where we model the whole system as a dynamical system where, where we say, well, that there's an autonomous car, that autonomous car needs to come up with a policy. Let's say your star is the policy of the robot car autonomous car, which is an optimizer of the reward function of the autonomous car. That reward function should depend on the actions, uh, actions and states of the autonomous car, which is usual. But what we are saying is that, well, we need to, that, that reward function should also be dependent on the actions of the human, that's UHS star. And well, what does the human do? Like, how do we go about modeling humans and how humans drive? Well, in this work, we model the humans also as agents who are approximately optimizing their own reward function, RH. And there is kind of like this nested optimization that goes on here, right? Like you can see that the policy of the autonomous car depends on the actions of the human. The policy of the human depends on the actions of the robot and, and they need to like think about each other. And we solve this exactly as a stack over game. You make those approximations. And we ended up seeing very interesting behavior too. Like, like I'm not, I'm, I'm suggesting that these types of approximations, they work in some settings and specifically in, in the setting of driving, we started seeing very interesting behaviors. For example, when our autonomous car wanted to change lanes, it wouldn't just wait for every single car to pass. It would start nudging in in front of another vehicle to kind of make room for itself and influence this other driver to slow down and consider this game theoretic interaction for more, more interactive, more assertive type of maneuvers, which was pretty nice. Unlike, unlike let's say, how autonomous cars today drive. But, but that's not the topic that I want to talk about today. I, I just wanted to mention that this is one very common paradigm of modeling interaction. But the thing that I want to focus on today is actually an orthogonal perspective to this. So, so I'd like to argue that there are a lot of interactive tasks that are actually not like playing chess. They have nothing to do with, with playing chess. And I want to spend a little bit of time talking about that and some of, some of our recent work in terms of modeling interactions based on this orthogonal perspective. So, so what do I mean by that? So, so imagine that we are looking at a collaborative task. I have two people like Alex and Bob here coming together, trying to build a structure together. But I really don't think in this setting, Alex is thinking, well, I wonder what Bob's beliefs over my policies are. Like, I don't think that is what is happening. Again, instead, like humans are really good at capturing the right representations, like the minimal sufficient statistics that is required for coordinating and collaborating on this task. Like, I don't think humans need to do this like recursive belief modeling in, in a task like this. So, so they quickly figure out what is the minimal information we need to keep track of and they leverage that and they use that as a way of coordinating with each other. 
And then one reason that I think that is what humans do is humans tend to be like one thing about, we know about humans is that they're bounded rational. They're not going to be able to like keep track of these high dimensional like belief structures. Instead, I think what humans tend to do is they tend to capture that low dimensional representation very effectively. And we often have names for that low dimensional representation, right? Like we might call it intent or role. And at this point, you might say, well, what is the big deal, right? Like there is a lot of work that tries to do intent modeling, that tries to do belief modeling over like five intents. And, and that's not what I'm suggesting. I'm not suggesting that there's a space of intents. Let's go do belief modeling over that. What I'm suggesting is I don't know what it is that we call intent. Can we go ahead and learn that? So we started looking at this problem and, and the way we are formalizing this problem is that oftentimes in interactions, there's a low dimensional representation that captures the interaction. And that low dimensional representation is, is enough for coordination. And one can even use that for adaptation and the fact that we change over time and maybe Alex and Bob learn to, to work together on this construction task. But that low dimensional representation, that is the key for capturing, capturing this interaction. And I'm gonna call that low dimensional representation a convention. And we've been using the word convention throughout a body of our works. So I'm not gonna be talking about all of them, but let's just refer to this as a convention that the agents tend to build with each other and, and use that convention for, for, for coordination. All right, so, so what I'm gonna do is in the first part of the talk today, I'm gonna to talk about these conventions. I'm gonna talk about how we can learn them and how we can influence them, right? Like if I can learn these low dimensional representations, these conventions, that's great. That helps me to react better, to coordinate better. But can I go beyond that? And can I maybe influence the interaction and guide the interaction to end up in a, in a setting that is maybe more preferable to me as opposed to, to others? And then in the second part of the talk, I wanna, I, wanna, I wanna focus on this idea of learning from interactions. So learning from non-traditional sources and learning from interactions. But let's first focus on how, how to enable these types of interactions using this idea of conventions. So, so, so to do that, we started looking at um, a concrete example. So, so, so let's look at a concrete example of two robot arms trying to play a game of air hockey with each other. So here I have uh, a robot arm that I'm calling my ego agent. This is my robot, this is the one, this is my learning agent robot that's trying to figure out how to do this task. And then I have this other agent, which is my opponent or, or could be my partner. So I, the reason I'm calling it other agent is this paradigm can actually work in collaborative or competitive settings. So I'm just gonna call other agents to not differentiate between partner or opponent. And then the idea is that this, this other agent is going to have some sort of policy, some sort of a high dimensional policy because the robot arm is, has seven degrees of freedom. So, 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 so the other agent is going to push the puck using these seven degrees of freedom. And the question is, how does the ego agent model that? And the thing I'd like to argue is that just like how humans like play these games of air hockey, we don't do belief modeling over a seven degree freedom of the other person's arm. Instead, like, right, we capture low dimensional representations. In this case, it might just be the direction of the puck. Like what direction is my opponent trying to push the puck? And again, that's often sufficient for coordinating. And then here, like that is the thing that ideally I would like my system to capture, the directionality. Maybe this other agent is pushing the puck towards the left or right or center, okay? So the thing that my ego agent observes here is a trajectory, and that trajectory is a sequence of states and actions and rewards. So states of the world, actions of its, uh, itself, so actions of the ego agent, ego agent doesn't see the actions of the other agent, and the reward that it gets. And, and, and the reward here is going to be uh, some high reward if you're able to block the puck, and then if not, it's going to be proportional to our distance to the puck, okay? All right, so that's a trajectory that we are observing. And then this other agent, this other agent has a policy. And I'm telling you guys what that policy is, but the ego agent doesn't have access to that. So that, that the policy of the other agent is it's going to push the puck. It's going to come up with a seven degree freedom like action that, that pushes the puck towards the right or center or, uh, or, or to the left. And if the puck gets blocked in the previous time step, it is going to push the puck towards a different direction. So, so if it pushes the puck, the puck gets blocked like on the right, then it's going to push the puck either to the left or center. So, so that is a policy of the other agent. The ego agent does not observe that, but, but that's the thing that, like, that is the underlying policy that the other agent follows, okay? So 
kind of like the core of the algorithm here is to learn this, this convention, this representation of the other agent. And the way we do that is by using a representation learning component where, where we look at a past trajectory. So this is trajectory, some episode at time k minus one. And we try to encode that into a low dimensional representation. I'm gonna call that ZK. And the ZK is an estimate of if the puck is being pushed to the left or center or right, but I'm not encoding that anywhere. Like I'm expecting that this representation learning component come up with a ZK that corresponds to those directionalities. And, and it's basically what the ego agent thinks the other agent is going to do next. And the way we enforce that the ZK is learning the right thing is that we use the ZK to predict the future trajectories, predict the next episode trajectory. So, so the loss function here, for, for this autoencoder-like structure is, is, is a prediction loss. So we look at a past trajectory, we wanna predict the next trajectory. And, and to, to do that, like for me to be able to predict, what do I need to know? Well, I need to know the state of the world. And I also need to know my own actions, which I already know, but I also need to know some, like I need to know something about the other agent's actions. And I'm enforcing that something to be low dimensional here. And, and that is exactly like how, how the system is learning these representations of the other agent that are low dimensional, that are helping with, with prediction of what happens next. All right, so, so once I have that representation, then, then I can use that representation however I want, right? Like I can use that within whatever planner that I prefer to use. And specifically what we decided to do was we decided to train a reinforcement learning agent that uses these learned representations, that uses these disease that we just captured within its, its objective. So what we're doing is we're training our, a reinforcement learning policy for our ego agent that maximizes the, the expected return. But this expected return depends on what the other agent is doing, and that is this Z that you are learning through representation learning. And then the way we are training these representation learning and reinforcement learning is, is in an iterative, like using an iterative process. So, so we learn a representation, feed that in, do a run of reinforcement learning, get a policy, get new trajectories, learn a new representation, and keep iterating between representation learning and reinforcement learning. And, and by doing so, what we are able to do is we are able to come up with policies that are able to react to the other agent's policy, that are able to have this model of the other agent and actually react to them. And, and this algorithm, we're going to call that Lily, learning and influencing latent intent. I haven't really talked about influencing yet, but, but so far, this, this learns the latent intent, latent representation of the intent of the other agent or the convention, and then uses that to react. So, so let's see how that works in this game of air hockey. So, so if I use soft actor critic, um, so state of the art reinforcement learning, after four hours of training, this, this robot learns this idea of blocking a puck, but it doesn't model the other agent's policy. It always goes towards one direction, al always goes to the left. And by always going to the left, it is able to block the puck some percentage of the time, like uh, here the y-axis is success rate. So it's able to block the puck like 40% of the time, because it always goes toward one direction. And by always going to the left, 40% of the time, it gets lucky and it's able to block the puck. But if you're using Lily here, what ends up happening is that after four hours of training, Lily is able to predict the opponent's strategy. And based on that, it's able to basically like uh, block the puck no matter where it is pushed. So, so it gets the success rate of like 90% because it has this model of the other agent. And it's not just a fixed model, right? Like here, the opponent is actually non-stationary, right? Like the opponent has some dynamics. They're changing. They're changing uh, their, their Z. And, and what Lily, like, like what our ego agent with Lily is, is capturing is that dynamics. It's actually capturing like how that Z is changing and, and uses that for, 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 for better coordination here. Okay. All right. So, so. That's all great, right? So, so what I've been talking about so far is an orthogonal perspective to theory of mind modeling, where instead of doing this kind of like game theoretic approach and then cutting the game, I'm arguing that there's an orthogonal perspective where we can learn a low dimensional representation that is a lot more effective, a lot more scalable when you're thinking about coordination, because then I can keep track of that Z and that is the only thing I need to know for, for better coordination. And then we have talked about how a reinforcement learning agent can leverage that Z to better react to other agents. But an interesting question to ask is, could we go beyond reacting? 
And, and what I mean by that is, could we, could we influence the other agent to act in ways that are maybe beneficial for us? So, so to do that, what, what we actually decided to do is to, to optimize this, this reward function, not within an interaction, but instead across multiple interactions. So here we are optimizing for a long horizon objective where we are optimizing this expected reward across multiple interactions. And that actually allows us to get policies that can influence other agents into specific ways that are useful for us. So in this game of air hockey, we artificially made it so that our ego agent really likes to block the puck like on the left. It, it really likes to go to one direction. And, we, and the way we are artificially making that happen is we are giving, you, giving the ego agent more rewards if it is blocking the puck in one, uh, like towards one direction. You know, like we are, we are artificially making one side like better than others. And what happens is that with this influencing like um, idea and, and optimizing the reward over long horizons, we are able, after four hours of training, we are able to block the puck no matter where it is pushed. Like so, so in terms of success rate, it is still going to be like around 90% success rate. So with influencing or without influencing, in general, we learn the model of the other agent and the dynamics of the other agent. So no matter where the puck is pushed, we can actually block it. But the interesting thing is with influencing, we can actually get the puck to go to the left more often than the case that we have no influencing, right? Like with no influencing, the puck is uniformly being sent to the left or middle or right. But with influencing, because my ego agent really likes to go to the left and the really likes is kind of encoded as part of the reward, because of that, my ego agent is able to kind of like get the other agent, manipulates the other agent to push the puck more often to, to the left. Okay. All right. So, so that's all great. So, so the thing I've been talking about so far is, is this algorithm, Lily. And, and what Lily does is, is it models the other agent, has a representation of the other agent, and uses that representation for better coordination, but also uses that representation for influencing the other agent and, and, and basically getting the other agent to act in ways that are useful for us. But the thing that I want to spend a little bit of time also building on top of this is this idea of influencing and thinking about other ways of doing influencing. So the, the way that we, we influenced here was considering this long horizon type of objectives, but there are actually other ways that we could go about influencing that could be more effective in a lot of coordination tasks. So, so let's think about let's think about a task of cleaning your house. So, so this is a thing that we deal with almost every day. So me and my husband, we need to like clean a house together and we need to coordinate on, on cleaning that house. Okay. And one of the difficulties here is that I often need to have this model, this opponent, a partner in this case, this partner model of, of my, my husband and what he's doing and, and need to like have like a really good representation of that before doing anything in the house. And that tends to be pretty difficult. This is a multi-agent task. It's non-stationary because in addition to learning how to clean the house, I also need to learn what the heck my partner is trying to do here. And, and that tends to be a pretty difficult problem because I need to keep track of all of these things. And in general, in multi-agent reinforcement learning, one of the biggest challenges is non-stationarity. And the non-stationarity is often coming from the partner or opponent, right? Like we need to model the dynamics of the partner, model the dynamics of the opponent, and that tends to be pretty challenging. So, Let's look at it abstractly. So I basically have a house. I have, let's say, two robot agents. They want to clean the house together, and, and they need to figure out where to go and what to do. Okay. So the thing I'm trying to argue here is that with influencing me as an ego agent, maybe I can take actions that guide my partner to do specific tasks that are more predictable. For example, if I can, if I can guide my partner to go to one part of the house, Right, like maybe maybe go upstairs and like try to clean the bedroom and 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 like the bathroom upstairs, and then I lock my partner upstairs so they can't get out and they can kind of like focus on that cleaning. Then it would become a much easier task on me because that now all I need to do is I need to focus on learning how to clean the kitchen. Like, and I don't need to worry about what is it that my partner is trying to do. Okay, so so it sounds like a very silly idea, right? But, but in general, like you could basically try to influence to stabilize the other agent. And by stabilizing the other agent, the thing we are doing here is we are reducing the non-stationarity of the multi-agent problem. 
And by reducing that on station narrative, you're making your task easier on us and easier on our partner. It's, it's kind of like role assignment, but the type of role assignments that you would like to get in this multi-agent learning type of settings. Okay. So, so that's exactly what we've been trying to do. So this is actually a recent work that was presented at, at CORE last week in London conference was in person, that was crazy. But, but we had a lot of fun at, at Coral and we actually like presented this work. And, and the idea of this work is, is that maybe we can learn those representations that I was just talking about earlier, but maybe we can use those representations in order to, in order to stabilize our, the other agent, to fix the other agent's policy, to make it easier for us to do the task, okay? So, so this algorithm, this algorithm is, uh, is, is called uh, like it, it's called silly, it's stabilizing and influencing latent intent. So, so it basically builds on top of the Lily algorithm that I was talking about earlier. And what it does is it, it basically has a similar component to Lily. It, it takes a trajectory, it tries to encode that trajectory into, into low dimensional representations of what the partner is trying to do. Maybe, maybe we are even like clustering the partner into discrete modes, or it could be a continuous representation of what the partner is doing. This is irrespective of what, what the representation looks like, if it is categorical or if it is actually continuous. But then once we have those representations, right, you would like to decode that and you would like to predict the future trajectory or predict like the future future states. But the thing that we are doing differently here is that we are, we are incorporating this, this latent strategy learning with, with another component, a reinforcement learning component that tries to differentiate between task reward and stabilizing reward. So, so in our reinforcement learning bit, instead of just optimizing for one single objective, what we are doing is we are optimizing for two objectives. One objective is the task reward, right? Cleaning the house, whatever it should be. And then another second objective is stabilizing the policy of the other agents. And what, by stabilizing, what we mean is we, don't, we, we wanna minimize the change in the low dimensional representation that we have learned about the other agent. So, so, so this is stabilizing that latent strategy that we have learned. And again, similar to before, we iteratively like optimize for the representations as well as stable, stable influencing. So it turns out that this algorithm actually works. And, and that was kind of surprising to us that it does. Um, we, have, we have looked at this uh, in a variety of environments. So we have looked at a set of abstract environments like circle environments with, with categorical and also continuous latent strategies. But in addition to that, we have also looked at some driving domains like changing lanes and some robotics domains where you're trying to influence your partner by going towards different, different types of goals and also some navigation, like listener speaker type of domains. So I'm not showing all the results here. I just want to show like um, one of the plots here. So, so here we are looking at basically our algorithm silly, which is shown in red, and then a series of baselines, including Lily and, and Smiral is this other algorithm that, that's a surprise minimizing um, out the reinforcement learning idea that, that basically tries to minimize surprise. Here we are trying to minimize the changes in the, in the latent strategy. Uh, as well as like other, other types of baselines, like soft actor critic. And, and I'm showing two types of rewards here. One is the task reward. So cleaning the house, right? Like the thing that we are trying to actually get at. And then the other one is this idea of being able to stabilize the other agent. So, so actually like explicitly for formulating stabilizing as an objective. And then silly algorithm is, is able to stabilize from early on. And that stabilizing is really the thing that is getting, getting our task reward like fairly high, like from the beginning, like very close to the Oracle. But a lot of other algorithms basically like fail at achieving this task because they are not able to stabilize or they take longer to stabilize and, and they're not able to get as high of a reward for the task, okay? All right, so, and, and why am I excited about this? So I'm actually pretty excited about this idea because I do think it has like other implications, right? Like the way I've talked about this idea so far is in this multi-agent settings where you have this partner or opponent and you wanna try like the partner or an opponent and reduce non-stationarity. But I do think non-stationarity is a bigger problem in multi-agent settings. And it's not just about the partner. Sure, we can treat it as a separate partner, but it is really part of like that partner is also part of the environment. And in a lot of multi-agent tasks, it is the environment that is, that is non-stationary and difficult to predict. For example, imagine that you have two arms and you want to cut a stake. This is something that we are actually pretty excited about because we have a whole other thread of work on assistive feeding and food acquisition, which I think is very interesting. 
And and we started thinking about yeah, like like food manipulation. So how do you cut a steak? Like the way you would cut a steak is, is you often need two, two, two arms. So like you can't really do it with one arm. With one arm, right? Like if you start like cutting the steak, it starts flying around and it becomes really difficult to predict the dynamics of the steak. So part of the reason, actually a huge part of the reason that we use a second arm to hold the steak is to reduce non-stationarity. Like the whole point of like holding the steak is that so, so the steak is fixed and I don't need to worry about the dynamics of the steak and where it is flying around. The dynamics of the steak is going to become very predictable the moment I hold it. So then my second arm, it can focus on the act of cutting and it doesn't need to like predict what happens to the dynamics of the steak. And I think this is a very similar idea to the silly idea that I was talking about earlier because they're also, right, like you're trying to reduce non-stationarity by stabilizing this latent strategy of the other agent. And then we're trying to explore this idea actually in the case of bimanual manipulation and in terms of like, like we're actually looking at the problem of like cutting food and, and what happens when you have two arms and what should be the role of the arms and if like this idea of stabilizing applies there or not. So, so this is very preliminary, but I just wanted to briefly mention why I'm excited about stabilizing. All right, so just to summarize what, what I've talked about so far, some of the key takeaways here. When we think about coordination and multi-agent type of problems, we often deal with these non-stationarities that could be arising from, from the environment or could be about the partner, right? The human partner or the robot partner. They're often non-stationary. And we need to capture that, right? Like we need to represent that. And one way of doing that is to do recursive belief modeling and try to represent a belief over the full strategy of the other agent, but that tends to be very unscalable. So what I'm proposing here is, is, a, is a very different perspective, which basically tries to learn a low dimensional representation, a low dimensional latent intent or latent strategy, or more generally, I'm calling it a low dimensional convention that, that, try, that, that, that kind of captures the, all that is sufficient for coordination. And then once we have that, once we have that latent intent or latent strategy, what we can do is we can leverage that for, for better coordination. We can react better, but also we can use that for, for a bunch of other things. Maybe we can influence the other agent into acting in ways that are useful for us. So in Lily, we saw that we could influence the other agents, the air hockey agent, um, to act in ways that give us more reward. But also in, in Silly, we saw that we could stabilize that. We could stabilize that latent strategy. And by stabilizing that, we can reduce non-stationarity. And that would make the learning problem a lot more easier and effective for us. Okay. All right. OK, so, so that was kind of like the first core part of the talk that I wanted to spend a little bit of time on. So the idea of learning and influencing interaction through latent intents. In the second part of the talk, I want to, I want to talk, switch topics a little bit, and I want to talk about learning from interactions. So first part was learning for interactions. How could we use learning ideas to have better interactive agents, better coordinative agents? But in the second part, I want to talk about what we can do when we have interaction data and how can we learn from them and actually bring humans in the learning group, right? So in, in the first part, like, I was motivated by humans, but nothing I showed really had any humans in there because it's still pretty difficult to bring humans in these learning groups. If you remember the air hockey example, I showed like four hours of training. I don't really know how to put a human in the deep RL loop with that four hours of training. So in general, we need to find like better and more effective ways of learning from humans, learning from human data. And, and that is, I think, really a core research problem in robotics and in human robot interaction. And, and I, want to, I want to spend a bit of time discussing that. So, so how do we learn from humans, right? Like how do we bring humans in the learning loop? Like I talked about all these multi-agent robot work, there was no human there, but how can I actually bring the human in the learning loop? So, so one very common paradigm in, in robotics and generally human robot interaction is, is this idea of imitation learning, right? Like this is something that is pretty popular and the idea is I can basically bring a person to demonstrate on a robot how to do a task, like pick up a cup. And I can do that with different modalities. I can do teleoperation. I can do kinesthetic teaching. I can do that in VR. But somehow I'm, I'm providing that demonstration data. And then the robot basically tries to learn a model of what it is, what it is to pick up a cup. Like they might learn a reward function, or maybe they would learn a policy. 
from those demonstrations to pick up a gun. Okay? So, so this idea of learning from expert demonstrations, this has been around more than 20 years. But that's pretty challenging. And the reason that is pretty challenging is that we don't have that much expert demonstrations just lying around that we can tap into. Like one of the challenges of, of robotics these days and the fact that we haven't seen the same sort of advances in robot learning as we have seen, let's say in NLP or in vision is that we just don't have like that much useful robot data, right? Like there isn't like expert demonstrations just lying around on internet. So instead, I think one interesting idea is that maybe we should try to tap into other sources of data, right? Like expert demonstrations are just only one source of data, but there are many other sources of data, non-traditional sources of data that are pretty informative. And maybe we should try to tap into those sources to try to learn something useful from humans. So, so that is in general a topic that we're pretty interested in in my lab. And, and we are looking at various types of sources of data, including looking at suboptimal demonstrations, imperfect demonstrations, or, or observations, right? Like there are, a lot of, uh, there are a lot of videos of people doing various types of things on YouTube, like, like cooking. Could we learn something useful from those videos? That's an interesting question that um, a lot of people are interested in these days too, but that's a question that we're also like looking at. And also it doesn't need to be just videos, right? Like even like, like demonstrations collected, let's say by VR, a lot of times are pretty imperfect. And how could we leverage those demonstrations in an effective way is, is an interesting question. Beyond that, we're also looking at other sources of data, like as I was talking about videos, we're looking at language instructions, narrations, and how could we use the multimodality of language and videos and so on to, to better learn reward functions or policies, or in general, like useful information that could be, that could be used for various types of downstream tasks. And in addition to that, we have also a whole thread of work trying to learn from pairwise comparisons and rankings. So instead of me getting the person to come and demonstrate a full trajectory on a robot, maybe I can just show two trajectories, a bunch of trajectories, and ask a person, well, which one do you prefer, and use that knowledge to, to better learn a reward function. And then finally, if you think about a robot, it's an embodied agent, right? Like it does have an embodiment. And, and we could actually move it around, right? Like we can kinesthetically moving around, right? Like we can actually like use forces and, and these physical corrections that we provide on a robot, they actually have a lot of meaning in them. And, and this is pretty different from like other like types of AI agents that don't have embodiment. So I think we can also like tap into these physical corrections and learn from physical corrections and effective reward function. And we have, we have some works in that direction too. All right. So, I'm not going to be able to talk about all of these different sources of data today, and I only have like, I think, 15 minutes left. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about some of this thread of work that we have on active learning of reward functions from pairwise comparisons and rankings. And I'm going to very briefly mention some of our recent work uh, in learning from suboptimal demonstrations, and I'm going to wrap it up then. All right, so, so what do I mean by pairwise comparisons? So, so what I mean by pairwise comparisons is, as I mentioned earlier, I don't ask a person to come and show me a trajectory like in, in, in the lab, because that seems to be very costly. That seems to be very difficult. Like that requires actual human experts. But instead, what I can do is I can show two trajectories, A and B, and then ask a person, well, which one do you prefer? And the human's response to this simple like binary question it's going to give me a lot of information about the underlying report function that the human maybe would want the robot to optimize. Maybe we would want the human to, uh, like the human would want the robot to avoid this box and maybe reach the, reach the black pad on the, on the table, okay? So for a second, assume that this reward function is a linear combination of a set of features. Like in a lot of our follow-up works, we have actually considered more complicated types of reward functions. But for a second, let's imagine that it's a linear combination of a set of features. So, so the parameters here are these thetas. These are the weights that we are trying to learn in this underlying reward function. And fees are a bunch of features over trajectories. And let's say that those are given. So when I show a trajectory to the user, the question is, what can I learn from this binary answer of I like A over B about theta? How is that going to update theta? So, so imagine theta, for example, lies in a three-dimensional space. And I don't know where theta is. Theta is going to fully define my reward function. Theta is maybe some point like up here. Maybe that is where the true theta lies. But I don't know where the th true theta is. I can imagine that it lies in a unit ball and I can start with that prior, okay? Then every question, every query that I ask a user 
that generates a separating hyperplane in this space of thetas, because that, that hyperplane corresponds to this theta times phi being equal to zero. And then phi, phi is the difference between the features. And then that, that question that I ask, and if the person tells me, hey, I like A over B, or I like B over A, that tells me, uh, that tells me which side of the hyperplane is preferred. So, so if they tell me, hey, I like A over B, that tells me that, hey, like everything on the right side of the hyperplane is useful, but everything on the left side of the hyperplane, we don't need to, we don't need to worry about that. That's not where the true theta lies. The true theta lies somewhere on the right side of the hyperplane. And that's that one single question that I would ask from a user. Then the interesting research question is what should be the sequence of queries, sequence of questions that I'm asking from a user? And from that, how can I go and learn this reward function, this underlying theta parameter? Okay, so, so we just saw one question tells us that one side of the hyperplane is preferred than the other. What should be my next question? How do I make sure that my next question is pretty informative so I can quickly converge to the true reward function? So, so, so that is this active learning question that we are interested in here. And the reason I think active learning is incredibly important in this area is that as we were just talking about, like we don't have robot data, right? Robot data is super limited. So if you're collecting data from, from humans, if you have human labelers here, we should be a lot more careful about what type of data we are collecting. We shouldn't just like blindly collect lots of lots of data in this low data regime situation. And we should actually be very careful about our next questions to make sure that it's the most informative, most diverse sequence of queries that we are getting. So we have a thread of work on this, uh, but I'm just gonna talk about kind of like the core idea here and not talk about the details of like what each one of these works are doing. So the core idea here is, is that we are solving an active learning problem where we want to find scenarios. We want to find two trajectories that we show to a user and ask them which one do you prefer. And, and that corresponds to this fee here. So this fee here kind of like corresponds to those two trajectories that I'm showing to the user, those, those scenarios. And I want to find, that's my decision variable. So I want to find scenarios that try to remove as much volume as possible from that hypothesis space that I was talking about earlier, right? Like this is the hypothesis space of all thetas. The true theta is somewhere here. I want to ask questions that correspond to hyperplanes here that the answer to those questions, whether it is left or right, is going to remove as much volume as possible from this hyperplane. Okay? And that is basically this objective. This is a volume removal objective. It's basically the, the objective here is a minimum of two things. These two things is if the person tells me they like A over B or B over A, how much volume would be removed, okay? So, and, and, and the reason I'm taking the minimum is, yeah, the person, I don't know if the person is going to tell me A is better than B or B is better than A, so I need to actually count like the minimum volume that would be removed and then maximize that because I want to maximize like the volume that would be removed. And there's a constraint here too, and that constraint is that the things, the scenarios I'm generating, they're actually feasible on the real robot that satisfy things like dynamics. And that is what the constraint really captures. And in addition to that, like this F function, you might be wondering, well, what is that? That, that F function is kind of considering the human noise here. So if the person tells me, hey, I like A over B, I add some level of noise to that because I don't fully trust my humans, right? Like I, I don't fully trust the fact that I need to remove everything on the other side because maybe the human made, a, made some mistake. So we actually have some sort of, some sort of noise model here to capture, capture the fact that humans are noisily rational. Okay. All right, so, so this is kind of like the core of it. So at every time step, I run this optimization. I come up with a new hyperplane, a new set of questions. I ask a user based on that. I try to update I, my, 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 my posterior uh, on, on the reward function. And then I ask my next question. There are a lot of interesting questions in this one slide that I'm skipping, but what this objective should be, this is one possible objective that this volume removal objective is a submodular objective. We can use like, we can, we can use basically theoretical results from submodular optimization uh, to talk about guarantees of convergence here, but it could also be other types of objectives, right? Like I could use information gain here, or maybe I could use determinantal point processes, which are a measure of diversity instead of this objective. And we have actually like work that tries to like look at these different types of information theoretic objectives and what are the effects of them. So it turns out that, for example, some of them give more, more distinguishable queries 
versus some of them that are giving us like maybe less distinguishable, but informative from the perspective of the robot. Because like in general, you want these queries to also be useful and, and easy to be answered by a human. So you would actually want them to be distinguishable. So, so there are a bunch of other questions that comes up here, uh, like in, in how to address this active learning problem. Here also, we are actively synthesizing the queries. You're generating these queries. It's not like there's a library of them and you're selecting from those libraries. You're directly synthesizing these queries from the continuous space. And based on that, we're able to ask these questions. So let me show you in a very simple example, like how that works. So, so this is a simple 2D car simulator. Uh, we have our orange car, this is our car. After zero queries, our car doesn't know what to do. It like moves around and hits everything. But then after 30 questions, um, we are able to learn how to keep heading. So our orange car keeps heading. And then after 70 questions, our car learns how to, how to keep heading and do collision avoidance, and just generally drive in this very simple 2D simulator. And I do think this is pretty exciting because I didn't get any, any demonstrations. This is like zero demonstrations, 70 simple like binary questions. And from 70 simple binary questions, I can generally learn how to like, what is a reward function for driving in, in a variety of domains, right? Like I can put like a bunch of other cars here and my car would do collision avoidance and stay within the lane and so on, which is pretty exciting. But as I was saying, we have looked at follow-ups of this work. So one follow-up that we have looked at is uh, the setting where we have nonlinear reward functions. Uh, and, and these nonlinear, because everything I've said so far was about this linear combination of features. We have looked at Gaussian process reward functions and just more generally like nonlinear reward functions. And we have looked at how to, how to um, use them in other types of domains. So this is a collaboration with folks at Caltech uh, where we are looking at using like these exoskeletons and different users of these exoskeletons actually have different gait preferences, different walking gait preferences. And it is pretty difficult to know what those human preferences of these gates are. Uh, and, and it's hard to like query people like, in these types of preferences either, uh, these types of preferences as well, because when you're providing these, these types of queries, uh, people are actually like feeling them. So, so there's quite a bit of interesting safety questions here too, right? Like how do we make sure that we are within some safe set when we are doing, when we are doing um, these preference-based learning type of ideas. Um, and another reason that I think this domain of like people's gate preferences and in general, the robotics domain is pretty interesting for active learning is here, right? Like 20 queries versus 30 queries actually like matters. There's a person here in the loop trying to like give us this, this feedback. And there is a huge difference between like 20 queries and like 100 queries. And a lot of other like active learning work in like less like robotics, like in non-robotics domains, oftentimes like active learning, the benefits of that is not that clear because like you see all these plots of active learning and random sampling and they're very close and the gap is not that large. But in these types of domains where we are actually interacting with a person in the loop, they're feeling our queries I think it does matter, like if you're asking 20 questions or 40 questions or 100 questions. So this was a pretty exciting, exciting project that tries to address these ideas of active learning. All right, so so far I've basically talked about this idea of learning from pairwise comparisons and learning from pairwise comparisons in an active manner that, that tries to learn some sort of unimodal reward function. This reward function, could be a linear reward function, could be a nonlinear reward function, like a Gaussian process. But in general, everything I've said so far is about a unimodal reward, right? Like some, some fixed like representation of, of the person's preferences. But in, in a recent follow-up, what we have looked at is a setting where we are looking at more complicated multimodal rewards. So, so far there is a robot, there is a person, that person has some sort of reward function in their mind and the robot tries to learn that. But in practice, that's not usually how our data looks like. Our data usually looks like a collection of a bunch of different users. And these bunch of different users have very different preferences, very different reward functions. And the robot has access to like that, that data set of different preferences, and it needs to identify what each one of these reward functions are. There isn't a single reward function that captures everyone's preferences, you need to actually be able to personalize and maybe learn a multimodal representation of the reward. So a very interesting question to ask is, could we learn a multimodal reward function when we are trying to learn from comparisons? And there is actually work that shows that with pairwise comparisons, that's actually not possible. 
like, like, like it's not possible to learn a multimodal reward just with pairwise comparisons. And the reason is, is kind of like clear. So uh, here, imagine that I have my, my robot and my robot has two different trajectories, one and two. Maybe one corresponds to putting the banana where like all the, all the foods are. And then the two corresponds to putting the banana where all the, all the fruits are. And different users might actually have very different preferences in terms of how the banana should be placed and what shelf the banana should go to. So maybe user one really likes one over two and user two would really like two over one. And then the robot would be pretty confused by seeing this type of data, right? Like the robot would basically get this contradictory information in the same data set from different users and the robot would not be able to differentiate between that, okay? So instead, an interesting question is that if like learning a multimodal reward function from, from comparisons is actually impossible, like there is work that, that shows that impossibility, could we instead generalize this idea of comparisons and look at rankings? Could we, could we look at pairwise rankings, and not pairwise rankings, sorry, full rankings, and from those rankings, learn a multimodal reward function? And we have a recent work that tries to address that. And given time, I don't want to go into too much detail about this. But this was also a choral paper that was presented last week. And if you're interested about this, I'm happy to talk about it offline. But let me just tell you what the setup is. The setup is instead of asking these pairwise comparisons, we're gonna show a number of trajectories, maybe like four of them, and then ask, it, ask a human user to come and rank these types of trajectories. And what the robot would have, different users will come in and different users have different objectives, different reward functions, preferences. And based on those preferences, they might provide a set of, set of different rankings. And the thing that the robot will have access to is just the ranking. So, so, so that is what the robot observes. The robot doesn't observe any, like doesn't know what, what each individual reward function is, but has access to the full rankings. And from that, the robot should be able to identify this multimodal reward function. So I'm gonna skip the details of how we go about it because it is uh, a little bit involved but we also use active learning here, similar to before. So once we try to make sense out of those rankings, we actually can actively query a person. And from those queries, um, we demonstrate that again, active learning is more effective in terms of uh, learning a true reward function, as opposed to let's say random sampling. All right. Okay, so I wanted to end in three minutes. So I just talked about let me, let me just briefly like summarize what I've talked about. I've talked about this idea of learning from pairwise comparisons and rankings and how they can be a very effective way of applying active learning in these domains and also learning if, if efficiently learning reward functions, let it be linear rewards or nonlinear rewards or multimodal rewards. And as I mentioned earlier, like we are also looking at other types of data, other sources of data, like suboptimal demonstrations. So very briefly, like, just, just to mention what the problem statement here is, we're looking at different types of demonstrations, right? Like we might have optimal demonstrations, but in addition to that, maybe we have demonstrations that are coming with, from robots with different embodiments that are not even feasible for our robot, or maybe suboptimal demonstrations. And the question that we are interested in answering is that given this data set of a mixture of demonstrations with different levels of suboptimality, could we have a way of weighting these demonstrations? And based on that reweighted version of the demonstrations, could we use off-the-shelf imitation learning algorithms and, and, and learn a policy? And then we have a recent work um, at NeurIPS that tries to kind of like address that. It's called confidence over imitation learning. The idea of it is we just do an iterative, like iterative bi-level optimization, where we are trying to learn the policies and learn, try to learn the, the confidence value on the demonstrations, and then we iterate on on. on the, the confidence learning and policy learning. And that actually allows us to learn from imperfect demonstrations because now we have a confidence value that reweights the demonstrations. So I'm gonna just show the, the, the pipeline of this. So, so we started a set of demonstrations. Some of them are optimal, like the green ones, and maybe some of them are suboptimal, maybe the red ones. And we have N demonstrations, a mixture of perfect and imperfect demonstrations. In addition to that, we also need to have a small amount of evaluation data. These are rankings, like, like rankings of some M trajectories where M is much smaller than N, okay? So we start with some confidence value for these demonstrations. These confidence values start like randomly, like at, at some value beta. And then we run imitation learning 
and, and for the, the imitation loss is, a, is an usual imitation learning inner loss here. There is this inner optimization where we try to imitate these demonstrations. Well, if I imitate these demonstrations, I'm going to get like really bad behavior too, because these were, these were a mixture of demonstrations. But once I have these demonstrations and my evaluation data, I also have this outer level optimization, this outer loss that tries to update my confidence values. So I update my confidence values. Once I have updated my confidence values, I can re-weight my demonstrations. So I can weight, uh, and, and by the re-weighting the demonstrations, I can basically get a better imitation learning policy that heavily relies on the good demonstrations and downweights the not so good demonstrations. And we keep updating that until, until convergence. All right, so I know this was very quick, but yeah, basically we have looked at this in a variety of robotics domains where, again, we have a mixture of demonstrations of a UR5 arm trying to basically move an object around and avoid obstacles and set it on the platform. We have this mixture of demonstrations and we show that our algorithm, Kale, confidence of very imitation learning, outperforms in terms of reward, expected reward, outperforms a bunch of other techniques, including ranking-based and confidence-based methods, and also just imitation learning type algorithms like Gale. But ranking-based methods like T-Rex, T-Rex, and SSRR, and then confidence-based methods like 2 and IC Gale are confidence-based methods that, that use like a measure of confidence uh, to rewrite trajectories. And here are just some results on how this, this works. So at the top, we see our algorithm Kale that from that mixture, it's basically able to achieve the task versus some of the other techniques that are, that are not doing so well. Okay, so let me just summarize. So, so the key takeaways for this last bit of the talk was that the fact that we can tap into non-traditional sources of data and we can be a lot more careful about how we collect our data. So we can look at suboptimal demonstrations. We can also look at other types of data like language and video and so on, and try to learn maybe a reward function or a policy. And active learning, I think, in general, plays a huge role in, 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 in space of robotics because it allows us to efficiently learn complex human preferences. And I demonstrated how we can use active learning to learn these um, reward functions, linear, nonlinear, and multimodal reward functions and human preferences. All right. So with that, just to summarize, we looked at learning for interactions. So how could we use ideas from representation learning? to enable better interactions? How could we stabilize? How could we influence other agents to actually enable better interactions? And we also talked about learning from interactions, from interaction data to actually bring humans in the learning loop and, and learn directly from humans in an effective way. All right, so with that, I can take any questions. Maybe I can. Thank you so much uh, for the talk. Uh, I would invite the audience to type their questions in the question and answer window. Uh, to begin with, uh, uh, I uh, have a comment here from Ruzana Baiji. Uh, it says, I like your focus on careful collection of data. Nice. <laughs> Ruzana, hi. I didn't know you're here. <laughs> Uh, good to see you. And yeah, I do think like how we are collecting like data actually like matters a lot. And I think it's, yeah, I think it is important to be careful about that, given that we just don't have like huge data lying around like Envision and, and NLP. Um, so it would be exciting to, to think about more curated ways of doing collecting data. And in general, data augmentation, I think, plays a huge role. In robotics these days like when we are thinking about using learning like half of our time is usually spent on how to do data augmentation how, and how to collect the clean data and we don't often even talk about it in papers but i think that seems to be playing a huge role in the type of the type of yeah garbage in garbage out yeah so so we want to be careful that you're not putting in garbage in <laughs> hi dorsa sweet. Um, great talk. I have a question about the Lily and Silly algorithms. So uh -huh. it seems like the um, equations you have look very similar to just like state dynamics, right? Like in model-based RL, we just predict the next state. So uh, my question is, how do you know if the environment, like the state dynamics or the agent is affecting the future um, representation? In that, like if I'm playing tennis and a bird randomly hits the ball out, um, well, this essentially you know, confuse the agent um, that's trying to model the future and that it doesn't know if the environmental state or the uh, opponent state is causing the next uh, future state representation. 
Yeah, no, that's a very good question. And, and it doesn't differentiate it. It's a very good question, yeah. So, so right now, sure, I'm using the word opponent, but this could really be part of the environment too, right? Like as in silly, like, like we saw, like some of those examples are not even other agents, they're actually like environment dynamics. So this is like really non-stationarity of the environment and I'm treating the whole environment as a whole, right? Like that tennis ball and like what the other agent is doing is all treated like together. And in the specific case that you were talking about, like I'd imagine that that gets canceled out because it's like a one-time instance and then you see like more persistent behavior from your opponent but if a bird like always like hits your ball like when you when you're playing tennis uh then like yeah like lily actually does capture that and maybe it should capture that right like because like that that is part of the thing that is affecting the dynamics um but that's an interesting question yeah i think you there might be cleaner ways of separating them if you, if you really want to do that for example like um taking a multitask type of perspective and work with your opponent in various types of environments to try to extract what it is about the opponent that you need to pay attention to. Uh, but yeah, like right now, we're really like not differentiating that. But that, yeah, that would be interesting. And I think, yeah, the key here is learning a low dimensional representation of that. That is really like making, making it actually like more effective and scalable. Um, hi, Dr. Sidi. Nice talk. I had a question that I wanted to ask you. So, like we have been talking about interaction so far, and I am I wanted to know what how you define and like quantify interaction. So, like in a game when both both agents are playing against each other, they are playing with some policy. So, in such a setting, in such an experimental setting, how would you define interaction and what uh, would be the the way to measure it? Mm -hmm. That's an interesting question. Yeah, so how do we define interaction? Um, yeah, so, so I'm using the word interaction a little bit more like generally to capture, like as an umbrella word to capture coordination, competition, like it, even like it starts from coexistence. So it's coexistence, coordination, competition, co collaboration and competition. So I put like all of these like under the word interaction. So. Um, and, and what that means is, right, so, so let's pick like collaboration or competition, right, like you're looking at this game of air hockey, like we are competing in that game, right, so, so the thing that is capturing interaction could be simply as a low dimensional representation, like the latent intent that I was talking about, or it could be like everything about the environment, or it could be the full policy of the other agent, all of these are going to be represent, all of these are going to be useful representations that capture what is necessary for coordination and collaboration here. So yeah, so, so I guess I, I use the term interaction more as an umbrella of words to refer to these types of objectives that we care about, collaboration, coordination, and competition. And what I mean by interaction data is when we have like multi-agent data of agents coordinating, collaborating, coexisting, and if we have like that, that multi-agent data, that, that is what, what I call interaction data and learning from interaction data. So a follow-up question on that, uh, like we have been modeling the NVAM, uh, the other agent, right? Um, and like when we actually model that agent, uh, model the agents in, around us, do we like customize our model specifically for the agent that we, uh, like the, if there are multiple agents and they are like very different mod, uh, agents as in a pedestrian crossing the road versus a car driving around you. So like, in such a multi-agent setting, how would you like handle such cases and model the agents differently? Do you customize it? Yeah, no, that's a good question. So, so that all comes, so in the, in the kind of like air hockey example that I was showing earlier, it was very dyadic, right? So it was like two agents, like and I identified that there are two agents and I'm trying to learn what the second agent is trying to do. If you change the policy of that second agent, I should be, still be able to learn that, right? The low dimensional representation should still be able to capture that. But in general, if you have like multiple agents and you're dyadically interacting with them, like same type of techniques could potentially like adapt to, to each one of these agents because the Z like that I was talking about is changing. You could use it for adaptation. We actually have a bunch of work that talks about adapting to different types of partners. Uh, and, and that is perfectly okay. But if you have like 
a data set, kind of like the last part that I was talking about, the multimodality. If you have a data set where you have data from multiple agents and, and you can't even like differentiate like who is the data from, then you need to have more complicated type of techniques that capture the multimodality. And the last part was really quick. I didn't really get into details of how we are doing that. But this coral work that we have, this recent coral work that we have, it basically tries to capture that multimodality from ranking data and separate out like what it is, um, like, yeah, if it is a pedestrian or if it is like an aggressive driver or if it is a timid driver and actually capture like differences between the rewards. Right. So there's a chat question, uh, question from Osbert Bastani. Uh, what are your thoughts on learning from large scale auxiliary data, such as traffic videos for driving? Um, learning from them, right? Yeah. Uh, that's hi, Osbert. First off, thanks for uh, the question. Good to, I don't see you, but yeah, good to know that you're on the other side of this. Um, yeah, so I think that's a very interesting direction. Um, so there's a lot of um, new uh, excitement around this direction. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen the foundations model paper from Stanford uh, that uh, basically Percy Liang was leading and we are thinking about similar types of ideas where we can actually tap into large data sets, right? Like maybe it would be like, yeah, traffic videos, or maybe it would be like videos of like, uh, videos of people like acting, like what videos of humans like acting in the world, like in the wild, and how we can tap into that to actually learn, um, like learn pre-trained models that are maybe looking at some sort of auxiliary objectives. So, so we're, we're not looking at necessarily full imitation, or we're not looking at like, full like like satisfying like full objectives but maybe maybe we are just looking at like prediction of like the next step and how we can use these types of pre-trained models to uh basically solve a bunch of different types of downstream tasks i think it's an interesting idea i don't know if it works or not right like it has worked in the domain of like nlp like we have like things like gpt3 and that's very exciting and again, we don't have like as much data in robotics. Robotics is a lot more complicated than NLP and vision, right? Like we are trying to like actually look at actions. Actions matter so much. So I don't know if it is going to like easily work, but I do think it's a valid research direction to actually like dig deep in. Uh, and, and I think multimodality would play a huge role there. So looking at these traffic videos, but also looking at other types of annotations and other types of data that could, can, can go along with it. And, and yeah, like learning these like pre-trained models, like for multiple types of objectives in similar way that NLP like looks at like language generation, summarization, like a bunch of like downstream objectives and putting them all together feels a little unscientific. I agree with that, but I think there is excitement and promise and we don't know what the answer is. So I think it's a very valid direction to think about. Hello. Um Hi, Dorsa. Thank you for the thank you for the really great talk. Um, I wanted to kind of uh, follow up on that really interesting experiment that you showed, where uh, I think Lily was the name of the algorithm that was able to lead uh, the opponent to consistently push the puck towards one direction if you allowed it to reason over long term. And uh, so that seems really interesting. And I was wondering what it is in the agent's behavior that the opponent was responding to. Can you speak a little bit about how the opponent was evolving and mm -hmm. how it was possible for the agent to influence the opponent's behavior in this way? Yeah, no, that's a very good question. And I've been in general thinking about that a little bit more recently too. So, so in, in that specific case, the opponent's strategy is something that is um, that the ego agent doesn't see, but it, 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 what it is is, it pushes the puck towards a direction. If it gets blocked, it is going to choose a different direction. So if I push the puck to the right, it gets blocked. I will choose between left and middle randomly. So that is the opponent's strategy. And, and it is a thing that it follows, right? Like, and it's not evolving. It's not a learning agent. It, it actually has that, 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 that strategy. And in that setting, right, like, like over time, I would learn that that is the opponent's strategy. I would actually learn that dynamics of the opponent's strategy. And I can kind of like take advantage of that, like by optimizing for long, long horizon type of objectives. But if the opponent's strategy was something that was a lot more complicated, like actually the, the game that I was showing, if it is just left, right, and, and, and middle, this is like kind of like playing a um, game of like uh, rock, paper, scissors, right? And the best strategy in rock, paper, scissors is to play randomly. So uh, if my opponent was actually playing randomly, 
like my 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 ego agent wouldn't be able to do any of this like like the strategy of my ego agent would reduce down to what soft actor critic was doing it would just always go towards one direction because he wouldn't be able to predict what the opponent is doing so so this type of influencing is only like valid when you when the opponent has a strategy that is predictable you could actually predict it and you could actually influence it and in general, I was having like an interesting conversation with Shimon Weizen last week in London. And he was complaining about like these types of influencing strategies. And he was saying like anything that is interesting, like the opponent is a lot smarter and you wouldn't be able to influence. And I kind of agree with him, like the more I think about this, like like anything, like if you consider like stock market, right? Like, like these types of strategies, like you wouldn't be able to influence because like very quickly your opponent learns and adapts to and, and yeah, like these types of competitive settings have its challenge, have their challenges when we talk about influencing. So yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Right, yeah, thank you, thank you. That does answer my query. Yeah, thanks. Can I ask a question? Uh, I, I found the example of uh, collaborative cleaning the house uh, very interesting. So there is always a, a trade-off between uh, uh, you giving your teammate uh, one part of the domain and say, get out of the, my way, uh, work in that region, and then I'll talk to you after you're done. And then uh, exploiting their abilities uh, to help you in your task. So uh, how do you control between these two settings? In one setting, there is really no collaboration. There is just partitioning of the task. And the second setting, uh, you have non-trivial collaboration. So depending on how we set up the problem, different policies would emerge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a good question. It's task dependent, I would say, right? So, so, so some tasks you would actually want role emergence. And if you look at like even like us as humans, like how we act, right? Sometimes we do get role emergence. We actually get like, yeah, like we are, like agents and ending up doing separate things because that is the more optimal thing to do. And in some tasks, like we do need like both of the agents to actually be available because the task requires like the, the coordination, right? So that's why I'm saying it is task dependent. If the task actually requires an action from both of the agents, then this type of stabilizing is actually not a good idea. Uh, so the way we are stabilizing this is um, basically we are also um, kind of like annealing the stabilizing weight so if stabilizing is not a good idea, like using, using the silly algorithm, it shouldn't emerge. Like, like at the beginning, you would lose a little bit because you're really trying to force the agent to stabilize, maybe for a task that shouldn't require, like shouldn't actually like stabilizing maybe is a bad idea for it. Uh, but like, as we are annealing, like you can always like get back to the non-stabilizing setting if the task requires both of the agents to actually be available and do the task. So I would think of this really as, a, as, a, as, a, as an approach for tasks that need that type of role or work better with that type of role emergence uh, or with that type of separation. I see, I see. I see. Uh, thanks. Um, are there any other questions? Uh, uh, there's a question in the, from the audience. Uh, with the hand raised. Um, hi, Dorsa. Thank you for the great talk. Uh, I have two questions. So the first uh, is related to the foundation model paper that you mentioned. Uh, so I was wondering, uh, I was interested in your perspective on this. Do you think, uh, because, the, because I think the paper uh, talks about how you need to collect uh, a lot of data and then uh, train like a foundation model for robotics uh, that we can then fine tune for downstream tasks. I wonder um, if you think that is the way to go, go, or maybe we should instead build a foundation simulator where we can simulate the real world really well and then focus on like learning in the simulation and then uh, transfer from sim to real later. That's a very good question. I don't have a satisfying answer for it. My answer is both. We should do both. We should like push in all directions. Like I don't think any direction is a bad direction. But if I were to choose between the, between those directions, I would probably choose the first approach. Like if, if I was deciding between one of these and like try to like dedicate my research time to one of these two directions, I would probably choose the first one. 
um, because sim to real, sure, like we need to like make our simulators a lot better, but uh, has its own challenges. But like this idea of like tapping into multimodal data, I feel like you've seen benefits of that in a bunch of other fields. So uh, like, I feel like I'm more confident, not confident, but I'm more like hopeful for this idea of tapping into real multimodal data to actually like achieve like real like downstream robotics tasks. Um, I think simulations have their own issues and they need to like get better like and, and for some tasks maybe they are better like for driving maybe maybe that is the approach to go for driving but for like manipulation I think we are pretty far from having good simulators that can deal with like let's say deformable objects like you're looking at like assistive feeding and like we don't we basically don't have any simulators that can like do anything in that domain so um yeah so so I think it does depend on task if I was doing driving maybe I would like look at foundation simulation simulators but if I was looking at just more general like manipulation task I would probably take the first route because that seems a little bit more hopeful but both the answer is both Thank you, thank you. And my second question is about uh, also about the Lily paper. Uh, so I noticed that in the Lily paper, uh, the well, the ego agent has no like policy in the beginning, but the other agent already has some underlying policy. And then uh, the ego agent tries to model the other agent. I was wondering uh, if like what your thoughts are on uh, if both agents start with like no policy. And uh, would some interesting behavior uh, emerge if, like, they they're trying to compete against each other, and we still run this Lily algorithm? Yeah, no, that's an interesting question. So yeah, so the other agent has a fixed policy, right? It, it's actually not learning. So the setup, and and our agent, yeah, is, is learning from scratch. You could start our agent with some pre-trained model, and it actually like works perfectly fine too. So like we were looking at like working with actual humans, and when you're working with actual humans, like their policy is different. So the ego agent's policy also needs to evolve. But we would start with some pre-trained ego agent policy for for those settings. Uh, but uh, in general, like if you want to have both of the agents to be learning agents and coordinate with each other, that ends up introducing a whole set of questions and it's not like obvious what sort of behaviors could emerge. Uh, it also depends on like what the learn, like we have been looking at that in simpler setups like multi-arm bandits. If you have like two learning agents coordinating on a multi-arm bandit. And uh, yeah, it's not always obvious like what they would converge to. And it really depends on what is the learning rate of like each of them. And it can get pretty difficult if you have two learning agents trying to co-adapt with each other. We haven't really like looked at that in the Lily example, but we have been thinking about that more abstractly in the multi arm bandit setting. And it is a difficult domain. Okay, thank you, thank you, thanks. Okay, so uh, uh, thank you so much for all the questions uh, from the audience. Uh, uh, thank you, Dorsa, for uh, uh, a very exciting talk uh, and an elaborate discussion. I would also like to thank uh, uh, Swati Gupta and Arjun Nanda uh, who helped uh, uh, with the questions. Um, please tune in for uh, next Friday at the same time, 10.30 a.m. Uh, for a talk, uh, the final talk of the semester uh, by Dieter Fox from the University of Washington. He will also talk about manipulation, I imagine. Uh, but thank you so much for uh, uh, attending the seminar today. Uh, let's thank the speaker once again. And uh, uh, so long for, from us. Thanks again. Thank you.